Hey guys, Ryan here with Plague Size Studios with yet again another AX8 centric My Top 5. With the Axe FX3 being out for quite some time and uh, the AX8 hopefully having a successor coming within the next year or so, knock on wood, um, it could be said that the AX8 is experiencing its twilight years, um, though I certainly won't stop using it anytime within the next probably five years if it keeps sounding as good as it does. Um, but I thought now would be a good time since I've covered um, a vast majority of, of kind of the, the uh, nuts and bolts of what I wanted to, to show off on the unit to uh, just take some time to talk about a few of the random tips and tricks I use constantly that just hasn't, it's either been too small of content to make it its own video or um, some minor points in other videos that bear repeating because I do use them so often. Most of these tips and tricks have the recording artist in mind, but there's certainly nothing stopping you from using this in a live session if that's up uh, more up your alley, which the AX8 was designed to be used live primarily in the first place, so you should have no problem with that. Um, so let's start with, uh, with an easy one that I really can't believe I've not talked about in uh, all this time. So acoustic electric processing. So what I'm a big fan of doing is recording the acoustic part of the acoustic guitar with a suitable condenser or ribbon microphone and then running the pickup preamp part out to the AX8 and then letting it do all the processing work. Um, there's actually a patch already built in to the AX8 and it's um, fairly low in the list. It's, it's one of the last dozen or so um, that is specifically made for that and it works really well. It's a great platform to build on. Um, I barely change it for my needs. Basically what I like to do is an enhancer block. So that kind of gives you a, a wider stereo image. You're probably familiar with me using that in a lot of videos. Um, works really well for a single acoustic guitar when you're trying to get kind of a wet, dry, wet stereo sound. After that, a, um, a little splash of chorus definitely helps to widen out the image and get some modulation effect. Um, you can turn that off for some types of music, but I, I really like it for, again, progressive and, progressive and metal stuff. Um, a delay every now and then sounds good, and then, of course, you definitely want some reverb here. And that will um, add a whole new layer to an otherwise kind of standard acoustic guitar sound, which will sound really good, but um, if you're going for either a wall of sound production or just want a little bit more space, you don't have to throw um, that process signal uh, very hard into the mix for it to stand out. It, it, it sounds really good, even in sparse amounts. If you want to apply this to a live use case, but don't want to have to mess with separate inputs for a microphone and all that kind of stuff, um, then I would suggest either just making another dry signal in the AX8 um, have, and then blending between the two, or you could just turn down the mix on the individual effects until you get uh, a happy medium between wet and dry. Um, so definitely useful both in the studio and live. Our second trick is also equally useful both in the recording studio and on stage for the sole purpose of repeatability. One of the things that still kind of cracks me up about vintage guitars um, and modern guitars in general, but it's especially important on vintage guitars, is the volume and tone controls. Me personally, I don't use tone for crap. I just have it wide open on a good percentage of my guitars. I bypass them completely being a metal player and even on clean stuff, I generally tweak on pedals or amps. Um, but the master volume is very important for many players. Not so much me, but there are instances where you want a lower gain version of uh, the same tone, you know. Um, or maybe you have an amp that's right in that breakup territory where you pick hard and you get the squeals and maybe you uh, add a tube screamer and it gets that the gain you want. But then you don't want to change the channel, but you just want to be able to roll off the volume and ah, perfect. There's the, there's the clean without too much breakup. It still retains a good tube tone. Well, the problem with the whole volume knob is that, yeah, you can get used to it, but precision on something like this, especially where there's no... Um, mark numbers unlike a speed knob it uh, is a little bit of a guessing game on on tweaking it either by ear or just muscle memory getting it to the same position every night or um, in a recording studio where you you're fiddling with it and you go oh crap that doesn't sound the same as i have it yesterday well, now what 
So what I generally do to eliminate that guessing game, even on guitars where I can see, okay, it's on six right now, is um, use a filter block. Instead of using the volume pot on your guitar to control its output, we can put this filter as the first effect in the signal chain and tie it to either on and off, on a set level, or even on an expression pedal to where you have, say, 10 is max, and if you have a set minimum level, say you roll it only down to five, then you can set the lowest position at 50% or whatever. Um, now, some of you might be asking, why use a filter block when we could do the same thing with volume? Because an interesting thing happens on volume potentiometers on guitars. It's not just lowering the guitar level, it actually kind of adds, um, acts as a bit of a treble roll off. The tone does more so, but um, the volume pot actually changes the load of the pickups or it changes the system load overall. Um, so this is just a emulation of that effect. It's definitely not perfect, but side by side, I think you'd be hard pressed to tell the difference, especially since we're running through all digital hardware to begin with. So for me, this is way more than close enough and I will definitely sacrifice whatever minimal differences there are for repeatability once again. So what I like to do is set this on the expression pedal, if I'm not using like a wall pedal or whatever at the same time. Um, so we'll set a high pass or a low pass filter rather, and then set the frequency to the desired effect. Generally, I kind of A-B test this with actually um, messing with the volume knob and getting it to sound similar and uh, do the same thing on the level. So you're controlling frequency and level at the same time. You can turn it on and off to one set position or use the expression pedal and there you go. There's your volume roll off. Trick number three is something you've actually seen me do before if you've watched any of the amp or pedal demos, but it's not something I called out as explicitly doing. Um, but it's one of the oldest tricks in the book for especially guitar YouTubers. Um, that is using the looper block to dial in tones. So I'll give you an example. Um, the Randall Thrasher review. There was several parts in that video of you hearing the amp being played live and me tweaking the tone knobs uh, live or even the gain or whatever. Um, I don't have three arms. <laughs> I wish it did. That'd be pretty cool. Um, but, uh, what I was able to do there is use the looper block on the AX8 and output out of the effects loop into the input of the amp. And so you're getting the same thing played over and over, um, you know, a track of a, a decent rendition of whatever I was playing. And then you have a constant output level, all that good stuff that you can tweak and, and show what it sounds like in real time instead of having to, okay, dial in, now we'll play, now it sounds all right. Now we're gonna dial in and cut 15 times in the video. You get to see that in real time. And um, that's really useful, not just for showing off products in the way that I do, but um, dialing in gear of all kinds. So you can stay within the AX8 box or use it as a looper pedal on other um, you know, real equipment. Of course, I have another external looper pedal, but I rarely w ever want to break that thing out just for um, this alone. The AX8 looper is really nice because you can uh, adjust the start and stop time. So say you hit start, you count like a bar or so, and then you start, then you end, you can, you know, kind of chop it off to make your playthrough continuous. Um, so it's also really good for dialing in patches if you don't want to sit there and again, strum and wait and whatever. Um, but I find it even more useful for real gear that isn't quite so um, 
precise when it comes to, to dialing in things. You, 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 know, you don't have the leverage of an AX8 or AxeFX unit where you could say, I like 5.45 better than 5.44 um, with this. You kind of got to, you know, kind of feel it. So that's one thing I do a lot when, uh, especially with like cover videos, um, I spent a good portion of time doing that for an upcoming cover um, with, with the looper. So I find it invaluable for, for dialing in tones. I'd highly recommend that you employ the same thing because it, it does cut out some of the guesswork. Um, you don't change your play style listening to different stuff and it, it does um, make for a bit more objectivity, which I think is always needed. <laughs> Now I've already made videos for these last two tips, but they are so important to the way that I use the AX8. I've used them so often here recently. Um, they're definitely worth repeating and hopefully I'll cover a couple use cases I didn't in those videos. So it'll be worth your while. Um, so number four is being able to record three very important streams of audio out of the AX8 simultaneously. So one is the DI track. Two and three are a left and right stereo image of the same wet signal. So what I mean by that is with a DI track, you'll be able to record just your guitar direct input, hence DI. Um, so if you have something like the Scarlett 6 6 interface that has a dedicated line input or something similar, um, and even if you set it up not necessarily out of the effects loop, but out of SBDIF or whatever, then you can record your DI signal so you can reamp it later. Um, that way, if you aren't particularly happy with your recorded tone, you can send it right back through the AX8, tweak it again, and oh, hey, um, now instead of a dual rectifier sound, I have an Ingle Savage sound, and this one works better for the mix, and that's very cool. But let's say that you get the mix you want the first time, there's another really cool trick you can do. So instead of recording two stereo or one stereo track at the same time, what I use this for, for rhythm stuff particularly, is two mono tracks. And that is by using a cabinet impulse response pan hard left and a cab IR pan hard right. And um, this was a trick I showed in a recording tips and tricks video. Um, but again, I think this is so cool that it, it's definitely worth repeating. Um, now, unlike reamping or mixing amplifiers, you're not able to get two different amp models where like something with the Axe 2 or especially the three, you can do that. But with this, it at least allows you to blend multiple impulse responses, which I think is super important. Whether it be, hey, I want a four by 12 cab and a two by 12 cab blended, or I want a four by 12 Mesa with this particular microphone and a four by 12 Mesa with this particular microphone, but the built-in mix isn't the way I want it, so I'm gonna tweak this. And then you can tweak the delay to get that cool phasing effect and all that. I think it's a, a definitely, um, one of the more important uses for recording on, on fractal gear in general. If you purchase third-party impulse response packs, a lot of the times this mixing process is done for you and you'll get kind of pre-selected mix one with these microphones, mix two with these microphones, these positions, blah, blah, blah. But um, I still prefer to kind of have each individual impulse response with one microphone each to kind of simulate that whole 
I'm mixing roll microphones set up um, because I, I do like to change it depending on the mix and it just again gives you more options later. So uh, definitely one of my favorite things to do and I use it on almost everything I record. On the covers you've heard so far, that's exactly what I've done um, is, is mix multiple impulse responses and it just fills in some of those frequencies that um, may sound great. Like if you're playing one IR, and you're playing a guitar alone, you think, oh, this is perfect, that's it. And then you throw it with drums and bass, you go, oh, crap, it's missing something, either bottom end or not enough mids, whatever. Um, generally, you throw in a second one, you can carve out some frequencies that are redundant, and then you kind of fill in that space, and it works really well. Our final trick is in the same vein of tip number one, where we're basically going to use the AX8 as a glorified multi-effects unit, except in this case, we're really just using it for cabinet simulation. And that is running a real amp head through the AX8. Now, like I said in the first video, for the love of God, do not take the power amp outputs of your amp expecting a speaker load and plug it directly into your AX8. You're going to blow everything up. Um, you need some type of load. So either whether it be a real speaker cabinet, if you don't mind playing out loud, or if you want to go the silent option, some type of load box like the Torpedo Captor or T Torpedo Live. Um, will do you just fine. Basically what we're doing here is taking the DI signal of a real amplifier, which sounds like utter garbage if you've never heard one. Um, it's, it's only recently that we've even been able to hear that because they've always been plugged into speakers that are meant for it. So it's kind of a funny thing. Um, but we're gonna take that and then put cabinet simulation over it and then record it. What I love about this setup so much is that it cuts out so many of the inconvenient parts of the equation of recording a electric guitar and uh, replaces it with stuff that frankly you probably already have if you're watching this video. So instead of, you know, say in this use case, we're just gonna run the DI output from the load box to the AX8, AX8 to your computer, you're done. Um, the normal setup is you, you'd have to run your amp head through a speaker cabinet like that. Of course, you've got to get it loud and that's obnoxious and a lot of you just can't record that way either because you have neighbors or you live in an apartment complex like I do. So there's one problem. Then you need an assortment of expensive microphones most of the time to make it sound good. Then you have to take that to a preamp and possibly if you don't want to record multiple channels, you'll have to have some type of summing unit and mix and match to make that sound good. Then you have to remember where the damn microphones were to begin with. Make sure you could do that over and over again if you are recording it. Um, and then finally, all that will go to your audio interface and your PC. So there's all these pieces that uh, you eliminate by doing that. And basically, you're replacing all that with an impulse response. Um, and that's just uh, so much more convenient. And you get 99.9% .9 the same results, um, especially once it's summed in a mix. You just, you just can't tell. It's, it's the guitar tone. Um, the nice thing about this, if you still like playing with that kind of out loud feel, um, this load box in particular has a minus 20 dB output where you can run it to the speakers and you can still play out loud at the loud tone without the loud volume, which is really cool. Um, so if you like to get you know a feedback effect on, on certain tracks or you just want to have that energy coming back into your guitar because it either feels better or that thinks it does, you know, you think it does something for you, then you can still do that and it's really cool. But it just makes recording that much easier. And you've again heard me do that on every cover I've done so far. And the next one will be doing the same. And I've showed it off on, on several different videos. And this isn't just a case of, well, let's pair as many pieces of gear together for shits and giggles. This actually has real application. So for instance, what if you have some boutique hand-wired amp that you want to record? Well, there's no model of it in the AX8 or Fractal firmware in general. Now what? Well, you can record it and still have Fractal audio effects, um, cabinet simulation, all that good stuff while using your real gear. Um, and if you pair this up and kind of a three cable method, um, you can actually use effects before the amp as well using the effects output. So you can say, well, I don't have this effect pedal I want, but I can run it into my amp that I have and then use everything else. So it's kind of, a, kind of the best of both worlds. Or you can do kind of what uh, Meshuggah has done on their recent tours is take a real amplifier, a real pedal, and use it for the rhythm stuff only, run it through the AX8 for the cab simulation, and then have the AX8 or Axe FX do all, everything else. So your cleans, your leads, that'll all come completely processed digital signal, but if you want some, uh, again, custom boutique type stuff, uh, stuff that you, you can't get in the AX8 or Fractal 
firmware, you can do that on the Rhythm. So there it is, the collection of my favorite tips and tricks for the AX8. Uh, hopefully you guys learned something out of this video. If uh, you have other suggestions, please let me know. If you got any party tricks yourself, I'd love to hear them. And uh, really appreciate you watching. Go check out the other videos if you want a couple other pretty neat things uh, to do with the AX8. Um, and with that, hopefully we'll see you soon with another My Top 5. Thanks for watching. Bye.